Hey gang, I am Joe Edelman and welcome to The Last Frame Live. So it's March, which for me means that I just completed another trip around the sun, but for all of us, it means that this year is almost one quarter of the way finished. Yeah, time flies. And I told you back in January, I'm not a big believer in New Year's resolutions. I mean, come on, more than 60% of those never see the way to completion anyway, right? But indeed, as I get older, I'm very aware of wasted time. So tonight, I want to talk to you about your goals for 2022 and hopefully maybe do a little so problem solving and talk about what you can do to make sure that you reach them. And I asked the folks online today in Facebook and also in my Facebook group for some input on their goals. And let me tell you, we got a lot to talk about. So for those of you that are here live, let me know in the chat, what do you want to accomplish with your photography this year? I also have some photo news for you tonight. And of course, we'll do some Q&A before we wrap up. So start typing. I'll do my best to answer all of your questions before we sign off. And of course, you know the drill. If you're watching live, please leave me a little note in the chat. Let me know who you are and where you're watching from already. Let's see, I got Joe in Michigan here. I got Robert in uh, New Jersey. I've got uh, Gone Dakota in Nova Scotia. Caitlin's in Seattle. I got Alvin in Virginia. I got Mike up in Montreal. Darren in California. We got Lynn in New York. Gabe in Miami. I got John on Thursday in Australia. Very cool. Uh, we got David in San Diego. We got Philip in Brazil, Rashad in LA. Thank you so much. And if you're watching, by the way, the replay, no worries. Drop a little comment below the video so that I know you are here, right? Look, all of you are part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch The Last Frame every week. And for that, I'm going to work really hard to help you with your photography in the next 60 minutes. It would help a lot more people find out about The Last Frame. If you could do me a solid, hit that thumbs up below the video, whoop, that side, <laughs> down there, okay? The more thumbs up, the more YouTube will recommend the show to other photographers. And of course, while you're down there, feel free to hit that share button. Let your photography friends know that we are streaming live on YouTube right now, or just go ahead and share the link lastframe.live. In fact, I'll go ahead, I'll drop that in the chat for you. You can also find it underneath the video, Twitter, Facebook, they're the fastest way to get the word out while we're live. So my speaking schedule this week, got a couple things coming up. Let me uh, switch over my browser here. Gosh, and here I thought I was prepared. I am so sorry. I was not prepared. There it is. Okay. So first up is the Visual Storytelling Conference. It's happening this week and it's virtual. Starts actually tomorrow, March 10th, runs through the 13th. And the best part is you can attend from anywhere in the world for free, which if you haven't signed up, what the heck are you waiting for? The link is in the description below the video. I'll also grab it here. And uh, actually, no, I'm going to have you get the link from below the video because that's the one that's got my code in it in case you decide to sign up for the VIP. I'll tell you about that in a second. But basically what's going to happen for me this Friday, March 11th, I'll be presenting Shoot Beauty, the psychology and the techniques behind photographing beauty. And then on Sunday, March 13th, I'm going to give you a business and marketing talk titled, if you have all the business you need, don't attend this presentation. Remember, you can attend the conference for free. In addition to myself, there are more than 50 world-class speakers, including Scott Kelby, Matthew Jordan Smith, Christina Shirk, my buddy Vanelli from Skylum, Photo Joseph, Scott Bourne, Dave Cross, and the list goes on. It's a big list, okay? So remember, you can find the link in the description below the video. Again, it's free. You can attend from anywhere. And there's also a VIP pass that you do pay for. You don't have to. The VIP pass gets the opportunity to interact with the speakers along with a whole ton of free software. Some cool stuff from uh, Boris FX. Um, let's see, uh, Aftershoot, um, uh, On One Software, bunch of really cool stuff, all free and included in the VIP pass. 
If you go for the VIP pass, use the code Edelman20 for a discount on that program. And then a couple weeks down the road, March 25th and 26th. Let me grab those. I'm going to be in Austin, Texas at Precision Camera. Uh, I haven't been down there for a couple of years. I have a lot of fun every time I go down there. We're going to be doing two days of hands-on creative workshops. So again, there's a link to the registration pages in the description. Actually, this one I can drop in the chat for you so you have it. We'll stick that in there. And uh, there we go. Cool. So you got that one. The cool part about this, it's a hands on both the events, Friday night and Saturday, hands on events. You will go home with portfolio images that are entirely unique to you. Pretty cool. This week in photography news, I would have to say that the biggest news is from Apple computers and probably Capture One. Uh, yesterday, Apple announced the new Mac Studio and the M1 Ultra processor. They're also adding the M1 chips to iPads, and they're releasing a brand new Apple Studio 27-inch 5K monitor, which will probably be added to my workflow. Uh, honestly, it seriously feels like Apple is back to making hardware that just makes sense for photographers and videographers. So that was pretty cool stuff. And then piggybacking on that news, Capture One announced that their software will be working on the new M1 iPads before the year is over, or excuse me, on the new M1 iPads and before the year is over, they're expected to release an iPhone compatible version. Think about that, Capture One on your iPhone. And that's not for you know using your iPhone pictures, it's for being able to tether with a camera. Really cool stuff. And then uh, in other photo news, Canon has announced that they intend to release 32, yes, you heard that right, 32 new RF lenses by 2026. I mean, how crazy is that, right? 32. So think about that, all you Canon shooters. At about six pounds per lens, you better hit the gym now if you want to be able to keep up with that, right? I couldn't resist. Come on. So, and just a little teaser for you folks. A few weeks back, I shared with you that I was using some Sigma lenses with my Sony camera, but I was having a little bit of buyer's remorse and I was testing out the Tamron lineup. Well, I decided, and I've gone all in on Tamron glass, and I am thrilled with the choice. So I will share more about why I made my choices and what lenses I went with in an upcoming blog article on my website and also here on The Last Frame. But in the meanwhile, I will tell you this, and you're going to hear me talk more about this over the course of the year. If you're in the market for new glass, new lenses for your cameras, you really should check out the Tamron lineup. As you've heard me say in the past, I won't use Sony glass. It's big, it's heavy, and it's insanely expensive. Tamron glass is lighter, it's more affordable, and it's capable of handling heavy use even in the field. So in other words, there's nothing that I can't do with it that I would be able to do with the others from Sony. So we'll talk more about that. That's it for the news this week, gang. And let's go ahead and get on to our topic because I'm not going to lie to you. This one, this one surprised me for the response that I got, like really surprised me. So for the last, you know, two years, right? Depending on what you shoot, you've kind of had an excuse for not making a lot of progress with your photography, thanks to COVID, right? So while we certainly have not heard the last of COVID, things are getting better. And hopefully we should be moving out of the pandemic stage pretty soon. And life is responding to or returning to kind of a, a new normal, a normal that allows for photographing people in all kinds of scenarios again. So it's time to kind of refocus, pun intended. What do you want to accomplish this year? And, you know, the reason why this whole concept even came up for me is that while I was traveling out to WPPI, which, by the way, awesome event, um, I will tell all of you that there are some big, big changes coming in the photography convention and trade show world. That's as much of a tease as I can give you right now. I promise you as soon as there's a little bit more information that I'm allowed to let out there, I will tell you. But uh, these are really, really cool changes. It's going to be awesome. So events like WPPI, events like Photo Plus, um, all of them, they're 
they're getting better and better and better. And believe it or not, we have the pandemic to thank for that because manufacturers and the people that run the trade shows, they've learned a lot about what you can actually do and how you can still maintain sales and get the kind of ROI they need for their time and investment. So uh, this is this is good stuff. And don't worry, I'm not talking about virtual stuff, gang. I'm talking about some really, really cool stuff, right? So while I was traveling, though, out to WPPI, uh, you know, I had some downtime stuck on a plane and, and all that kind of stuff and, and, you know, really kind of get into thinking. And one of the things that I tend to do when I have that kind of downtime or if I'm, you know, stuck in a boardroom, uh, a hotel room and I bored and I, you know, can't fall asleep at night, whatever, is I, I kind of let myself daydream a little bit in terms of what am I working on? What projects do I have in the pipeline? What do I want to be working on? Where, where, where am I going? Where do I want to be going, right? Am I am I truly headed in in a direction that's going to take me a place where I want to get? Um, as a photographer, as a business person, as an entrepreneur, you may have heard me talk in the past about uh, the fact that I really embrace a value set that was uh, talked about a lot by Steve Jobs. And excuse my French, but I'm going to say it the way he said it. It's basically break shit, move on, right? So I have always been willing to take chances, to try new things, to see what it's all about and to, to dive into it. And even with what I do for here, you know, here on YouTube for you folks and what you see me do on social media, if you follow me long enough, you see me start things, stop things, make a left turn, make a right turn, go in a different direction. I'm always going to move where I find the biggest impact and, and get the best response for my efforts. In other words, best return on my investment. In my case, that return on my investment isn't just about profits. It's about impact. It's about being able to connect with photographers and being able to have an impact on the industry and have an opportunity to teach and to educate, right? So during this trip, um, you know, I just kind of had the awareness uh, on the plane, flying out there that, you know, March is right around the corner. I was flying, you know, to Vegas on, on February 27th. So it was right at the end of February. And it was this reality check of, wow, my birthday is right around the corner and March is here. And before we know it, we're going to be at the, you know, middle of March and then the end of March. And then this year is one quarter of the way done. And look, I don't know about you, but Maybe it is because I'm getting older, who knows? But I find that every year that goes by, it seems that time travels faster and faster and faster, and that the years go faster and faster and faster, and there's less time. And so for me, it's really, really important. I still have a whole lot of stuff that I want to get done in this life. So I am very aware of time and the investment of time and, and what I'm getting for my time, and, and I protect that. And I put a lot of value on that. And I think we all do in different ways. And this is not a question, by the way, I saw in, in the beginning of the evening, one of the first comments of the night, Robert, I love you. But man, sometimes, you know, R Robert Varner from New Jersey, I'm not a professional, so I don't have any photography goals for 2022. Robert, look, I got to be honest with you, man, that's a shame. Then you should just, dude, you should sell your cameras, throw them away, better yet, give them away, give them to somebody that's deserving. But what the hell do you need a camera for then, okay? Look, this isn't a conversation about professional photography. This isn't a conversation about having money. And just so you know, some of you are not gonna be happy with what I'm about to say. I don't have any solutions for you. That's not why I chose this topic tonight. I chose this topic tonight because I knew, I didn't think I'd get quite the response that I did, but I knew there would be people that would have some legitimate frustrations that would start the conversation. And then from there, I knew that we'd add some. Well, it turns out I got a ton of response and I, we're already adding more in the chat. But what I want all of you to hear is that the same challenges that you have, other people have them. We, you, me, we are not that unique, right? We're the ones dealing with the challenges on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis. So they feel unique to us. They feel like there are challenges, but everybody has similar, if not the same challenges. 
right? So part of the reason why I point that out, it's it's not a put down, it's, well, I don't know, maybe it's a bit of a kick in the butt, but the point is like, look, you know, feeling sorry for yourself or being frustrated about it, that's not going to help you. Giving up certainly doesn't help you. So it's really a matter of sometimes you got to take a little bit of a step back. Sometimes you have to take a little bit of a step back. You have to reevaluate. You have to reevaluate your goals. Are you being realistic? And you have to reevaluate how are you approaching them? What are you trying to accomplish? So the other reason, I, I had another reason for asking this question. It's a little bit of a selfish reason, but you'll benefit from it. And that was that I wanted to get a sense of where are all of you at with what you're working on, what you're struggling with, what you're trying to accomplish, so that I can use that to tailor some of the education that I'm going to create over the next six months or so. There's tons of things that I could teach and that I could talk about, but I want to talk about the things that are going to have the biggest impact. So what I want to do right now, um, and I haven't seen any actual photo questions. I've seen a lot of people contributing to the question. What are your goals? And I appreciate that. Keep it coming. Uh, but um, I will make sure that I kind of stop maybe about 10 minutes ahead of, of uh, the top of the hour just to make sure that I haven't missed any questions. And I'll go back and I'll get those questions. But I want to just touch on some of the struggles that people are having. Some of them, I can make some suggestions right now. Others, uh, some of you may have suggestions. Maybe you were in that spot a year ago. Now, remember, before you're too quick to throw suggestions on the pile, consider all the possibilities. Consider that this person's situation may be very different than yours, even though they're mentioning something that you went through. So just be careful how you, you, know, you present your situation, right? Or your, your solution, okay? So um, for me... Um, well, actually, okay, there's a good question about the metaverse. That's one of the questions we'll take up at the end there, Aussie to you. Um, Seth Grogan um, wants to sell a print to someone who is not my mother nor my grandmother. Other than that, wants to finish your non-photographic really PhD. Well, so um, as far as the PhD goes, good luck. Um, you know, my wife is a PhD, or you may have, you may not, but I talk about it routinely. My wife is a PhD um, in cognitive psychology. Um she always basically says that people that go after PhDs are, are nuts and crazy. And pretty much every PhD that I know who was a colleague of hers will tell you the same thing. So, Sean, I wish you luck with that. Um, but uh, as far as the selling a print to someone who is not my mother, uh, I will tell you honestly, Sean, that the step to that is um, you've got to put your photography in a place where people are looking for it. Um, honestly, one of the easiest ways to do that, which you can do very simply, very inexpensively, would be to look at a website like uh, Fine Art America, or for that matter, even Etsy. You'd be amazed how many photographers are selling art images on Etsy. So food for thought. But a little bit of research, uh, a little bit of Googling, you can get there. Jerry R., I want to get better at photographing people. I think we all do. I still want to get better at photographing people, right? And that's what I do. Um, Jerry, I mean, the simple answer there is, Put people in front of your camera and shoot. That's about practicing. I mean, that really is. Uh, I will tell you, um, you really should sign up for the Visual Storytellers Conference this weekend and make sure that you attend my talk on Friday. Even though it's kind of centered around beauty, as you heard me say in the title, it is a talk that's a lot about the psychology behind, um, you know, photographing people and photographing beauty. So, a lot of that has to deal with the prep work that goes into making a shot successful, that goes into communicating with your subjects. So all things that will help you even with basic portraiture, and for that matter, some of it even would help with street photography because it's it's that, that interaction between people, right? So uh, I saw Sean had a follow-up here. He said that he actually has an Etsy shop, not sure how to market it, I think. Well, yeah, so I mean, that's a big piece of it, Sean. So I know that Etsy provides some information uh, and recommendations for marketing. Because when you when you have a, a, a shop or a profile on a website like Etsy or a website like uh, Fine Art America, that's kind of like having a storefront, you know, downtown in your local town. But if nobody knows you're there, you're probably only going to get a couple people to come by. And then 
for those couple people to come by, the challenge is, is do you have something that actually interests them, right? So uh, one of the ways you're going to market it is you're going to market it via social media. Another way that you're going to market it is to partake in some of the advertising opportunities that Etsy has, which they do have some opportunities, uh, or even for that matter, to consider looking at some simple Facebook advertising or Google ads. Do your research and do a little bit of learning first because those things cost money. And also, Sean, one of the things that you really have to kind of factor in on this, just keeping it real, you've got to be honest with yourself about your work. Does your work have value to other people? As photographers, gang, and look, this applies to all of you, right? Especially all of you that want to make more money in, in any way, shape, or form. I don't care what you do. I don't care if you're shooting portraits, weddings, if you want to sell artwork, it doesn't matter, right? Um, you have got to look at your work realistically. Because remember, your work is always going to have more meaning to you. It's your passion. It's your photograph. It's your creation. It's your baby. You were there. You had that experience. So no one else who sees that photograph is going to have the same experience that you did. But yet you're hoping they're going to want to buy it and then put it on a wall, right? So that is your challenge. And sometimes we need to give ourselves a reality check that says, well, you know what? My work's good and it's a whole lot better than it was three years ago, two years ago, five years ago. But indeed, it's probably not where it needs to be for somebody to say, I've got to have this on my wall. And Sean, the other thing that you got to be realistic about is, uh, depending on what you're selling on Etsy, if you're selling images with the hopes that people will buy you know, like 11 by 14 prints, that's probably not going to get you where you need to go, right? Um, if you're looking at selling images for wall decor, you need to be selling images that are going to look amazing at a minimum of 16 by 20 or 24 by 36 or 48 inches or up. Um, one of the things you might want to do is you might want to Google the name Peter Lick. Uh, it's Peter, P-E-T-E-R-L-I-K. Um, it speaks for itself. Just Google his name. Look at his imagery. Um, you'll notice that I believe he has the record of selling, I believe, four of the top five, something like that, some crazy number of the most expensive prints ever sold in history. Um and his work is truly incredible. He does landscape, nature, all that kind of stuff. So, but you'll see immediately when you look at his body of work, um, how you could imagine having any of those images on a wall. Like it would, it would make the room, right? So, um, so I'm not saying you've got to be able to match Peter Lick, but I'm saying you've got to kind of look at it through that lens to see, you know, is is my work, you know, headed in in that direction? So, okay, all right. Art Visual, good to see you again, man. It was a great talk that we had. You're going to get rid of your DSLRs and get into mirrorless? Cool. And start shooting video. I mean, video is a lot of fun. So unless you're looking to make a transition into video, my sincere advice is just play with it. And honestly, one of the best things you could start doing even before you make that change, start shooting video with your iPhone or your Android, whatever you have. But, but just so that you have the opportunity to start to do some editing. Um, believe me, if you can start to build a video skill set with your phone, once you kind of make that step to a camera that is really designed to be shooting video, like a mirrorless camera, I mean, you can shoot video with DSLRs, but it's, it's a bit clunky, right? So, um, you know, to be able to shoot video with a mirrorless, it's actually going to give you an advantage. It's going to give you kind of a step up, um, especially on the editing side of things. So nothing that says you kind of have to wait entirely for that, right? Okay. Um, Rashad's got a question here. As a portrait photographer, how vast of a portfolio do you need to create a business out of uh, or a website? So actually, there's a couple things that, that are worth mentioning here. Rashad, that's a great question, number one. So I will tell you one of the things that surprised me, and if you check out my Facebook page, um, if you are a member of my Facebook group, you'll see that I posted this question in there and got an insane amount of responses. And I will just let all of you know that probably 70%, if not more, of the responses 
have to do with business and making money. Okay. So that being said, for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to dedicate the last frame episodes to um, some marketing, some social media, some website stuff, et cetera. So um, going back to Rashad's question though, uh, as a portrait photographer, how vast of a portfolio do you need to create a business out of it? I have a saying that I use all the time, Rashad, and that is that you can look like a rock star with five pictures, or you can look like a complete hack with 10, right? So basically the short version of that is less is better. Unless your work is just amazing. Unless your work is off the charts. Less is better. The number one rookie mistake that new photographers make, and honestly, sometimes even some very experienced photographers make when it comes to their marketing and their website, and especially portfolios or galleries, is they feel that they have to include pictures that show every possible scenario, every imaginable thing that they could shoot or have shot. But the problem of it is, and the reality of it is, gang, when you're dealing with clients, more often than not, please listen closely to this. When you're working for a client, more often than not, the image that you create is not going to be portfolio worthy. Now, I'm not making a statement about your capabilities or your skill set. I'm making a statement about the fact that when you're working for a client, you're creating something that meets the client's vision. You're creating something based on the client's specs. Some clients, the reality is, they're clueless. So there's no way you're going to produce something that's amazing. Other clients, for whatever reason, it may be budget, could be formatting, whatever you may not be able to create an image that satisfies them that is going to be an image that you are most proud of and that is going to get people to notice you, right? So don't feel initially that you've got to basically, you know, show anything and everything that anybody could possibly consider asking you to do. You need to show your best. As you build out a quality portfolio of quality images, then you can add. So I'll give you a perfect example, gang, from a marketing standpoint. First time website builders frequently would be, well, I want to do portraits and weddings. And they shot a bunch of portraits, but they only ever shot one wedding. So they feel they need to jam like 15 pictures from that one wedding onto their website in its own gallery called weddings. And so what you wind up with is a really not great gallery of wedding pictures that basically tell people because it's all the same couple. So it basically tells people, you've only ever shot one wedding. That's not going to help you a whole lot, right? Less is better. If you've only ever shot that one wedding, if you and if you only have one amazing image, you just create an overall portfolio of pictures for that first website. And that image is part of it. As you shoot more weddings and you get more great images, you add to it. And by the way, I don't care what genre you're, you're planning to build your business in, even weddings. Be resourceful. It takes money to make money, gang. That's just the reality of business. It's got nothing to do with photography. So find a couple people who will model for you. Find a dress store that's willing to loan you a dress or two, or find people that have their wedding gowns. Find a church that will let you shoot or do some location things and create some samples on your own. The benefit to doing that, when you shoot a wedding for real, it's just like doing a client job. You don't have full control. You are at the mercy of the environment, of the couple, of everything else. When you shoot a wedding for real, it's a matter of, you know, how drunk is the groom by the time he walks down the aisle? How, you know, screwed up is the rest of the bridal party because they've been drinking since eight o'clock that morning or actually since the night before because they never really went to bed. You know, you're dealing with all of that as you're trying to make amazing images. So the best way to build that portfolio out initially is to go and shoot stuff where you've got control. Food for thought. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Uh, just scrolling on down. Narrowband channel. Based on that, it seems it would be better to show a few photos rather than a complete wedding album. Absolutely. Um, you know, narrowband, there are, you will find a lot of photographers, wedding photographers who have been at it for a while that may 
have a full sample album that you can view on their website, or even when you go to meet them, you can look at a full sample album. These are photographers, well, the smart ones, are photographers who have been shooting for quite a while, who have really developed their skills, and they're able to do that, to, to legit show you a full one and start to finish, because number one, they developed a brilliant skill set, and because number two, they shot enough weddings that along came the wedding with a really photogenic couple, a well-behaved bridal party, and extended family, and a day where they, the photographer, they were on their A-game. And it all came together, and there's a perfect sample wedding. But don't show a wedding just to show a wedding. Really, really bad idea. Okay? All right. Let's see here. Scrolling back up to see some of these. Uh, let's see. Spectre Man, just got your mannequin. Good for you, man. Uh, goal is to work on the fundamentals of the craft based on my skill level. Yep. And that's it. So really your challenge is, is keep pushing to um, find time, right? Find time and and put in the time. That is, that is absolutely the key, okay? Um, and let's see here. Uh, scrolling on up, okay? Um, and whoop, there, that's where I left off. Okay, so Brian said here, his goal is to grow his skills at seeing light and controlling light better. Awesome. So, and that doesn't even have to be in the studio, Brian. You know, you can go out for a walk and really work on learning to see light, see details and that. So again, that's one of those ones where it's like, you know, put in the time, um, you know, really um, get the practice in, right? Danny, you couldn't find me in the trade show floor at WPPI because you're only there for an hour. Yeah, and Danny, I didn't spend much time on the trade show floor. If you were only there for an hour, you saw you wasn't there wasn't a whole lot there. Uh, WPPI for me is all about networking, man. Uh, networking and shooting. So, um, you know, when I wasn't teaching, I was meeting with people, talking to people. Um, Tuesday afternoon, actually, the whole afternoon, I did portfolio reviews. So I was, you know, sitting where the, the portfolio review section is. Um, and then I was out of town on Wednesday because I had nothing, no other commitments. So I left, um, like midday Wednesday. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's see here. Scrolling up. Um, Philippe, I've been dedicating myself to studio portraits and I want to build a good portfolio this year. Awesome. So again, that's another one of, you know, put in the time, put in the practice. Alfredo Perez from Lansdale, man, you're right down the road. I was born and raised in Lansdale. I went to North Penn High School. There you go. So. Uh, Caitlin Martin, want to learn to be able to see better images this year, not just snap a photo, but really look and find an interesting image. And Caitlin, one of the, the biggest challenges to doing that, which I think is, that's honestly something that, that every photographer should always be wanting to do every year, no matter how good they get, because that's one of those value sets that's kind of taking you to the next level and taking you to the next level. And really, honestly, Caitlin, what it is, um, it starts with slowing down. The idea of being able to see better images and notice the little details, that's step one of what you said, that requires some serious mindfulness. It's, it's being in the moment. It's giving yourself the bandwidth to notice those kind of details and, and to pick them out. And then part two of that comes from the practice, and that is the experimenting the willingness to fail, the try new things so that you're taking what you see and what you see that's interesting and you are now creating around it and or using it to create something that is visually interesting and visually unique. So um, it's a great value set. It's definitely one that you got to keep at and keep at and keep at for sure. Okay. Um, Canadian Source Rats, because Mike, I would like to start my photo business this year. Cool. So Mike, tell me a little bit more. What kind of photo business are we talking about? Like photo business can be a lot of stuff. So tell me a little bit more. Um, Darren Land, I really, um, I enjoy shooting action sports, outdoor nature and architectural photography. I dread and avoid and intimidated with portrait photography. 2022 goal, get comfortable shooting posed portraits. Okay. So uh, a couple of things I'll tell you there, Darren, uh, and, and tell all of you. Number one. It has for a long time been my contention slash argument that the one genre of photography that every photographer should learn to be 
competent at, right? Notice I said specifically competent. I didn't say you have to excel at it. I didn't say you have to be amazing at it, okay? Uh, but should be competent at it. The one genre that every photographer should be competent at is portraiture. And there's a really simple reason. I, I'm not saying that because I shoot portraits. Relax, that's not, not the reason at all. The reason is, if you have good cameras, you will be asked to take a portrait of somebody. Somebody in your family is going to ask you, a friend is going to ask you, relative, whatever, right? So if you've got cameras, you will be asked to take a portrait, period. So it is a very fair argument that the one genre of photography that every photographer should be learning and be competent at is portraiture. So, you know, that being said, Darren, you know, the idea that you want to get better at it, excellent. Because getting better at anything is always good. Really what you have to look at though, is if you're looking at it from a business standpoint, which you didn't say that, so I'm making the leap here, right? But if you're looking at the idea, well, I want to make money doing portraits. Um, if it's something that you dread and you're intimidated by and you're really not into, so that's the last piece. So I'm adding words there. If you're really not into it, then I would caution you about trying too hard to make money at it. So if it's about learning it because it's something like I really just want to add that skill set, awesome, cool. I'm a big supporter of that. What I discourage people from doing when it comes to business, so the money-making side, if you are not passionate about what you're going to shoot, don't do it. I can't tell you how many times I hear photographers tell me, well, you know, I love doing landscapes and wildlife, but there's no money in that. So I'm going to go and I'm going to shoot weddings because I know I can make money in weddings. And I guarantee you, every person I've ever met like that, every person fails and, and fails miserably, right? If you don't really enjoy the topic and if you're not passionate about it, it's not going to work. So again, if it's a, you know, kind of personal goal and, and, and pursuit, awesome. Um, and, and Darren, the best thing you can do is find somebody that you know, find somebody that you are comfortable with, and then basically create a situation where you're going to use them as a, a living, breathing practice dummy, right? So the idea being that you are simply going to ask them like, Hey, would you be my living mannequin? And by doing that, what it does for you, Darren, is it takes all the pressure off and it takes some of the awkwardness off. Because at that point, you've essentially given yourself the permission to not have to say all the right things, to not have to talk with them and entertain them, to actually get the lighting wrong and have to play with it and experiment with it, right? So, and you do that with a friend. You do that with somebody that, that you know. It's the best way to, you know, to start. Uh, or, of course, you can start with a mannequin, which is going to help you with the lighting aspect. And then, you know, from there, you graduate into to getting, you know, real people in front of your camera. Okay? All right. Um, Alfredo, I want to quit my engineering career and become a commercial art photographer, but that scares me. Yeah, so I would say, Alfredo, you've, you've got your sentence backwards. That's why it scares you. Okay? Um... I would be the first to tell you, I don't care what kind of photographer you're talking about. I would be the first to tell you, quit an engineering job, which most engineering jobs pay somewhat decently, right? Um, quit an engineering job to become a commercial art photographer, which could mean a whole bunch of things, but we don't even have to narrow that down. I would say, yes, that's a really bad idea. Become a commercial art photographer while you're an engineer. Build your skill set build a following, start to build a business. In other words, build momentum. Reach the tipping point. Reach the tipping point where your photography is taking up more and more and more of your time, making money, and you've got to make a choice. Either slow down on the photography or stagnate with the photography or quit the engineering job and really go whole hog on the photography piece. But, um, and I'm being nitpicky, but the way you have it typed, quit the engineering career to become a photographer, I would say that's a horrible idea. So flip it, become the photographer that you want to be and then quit the engineering job and 
it's going to be a lot less scary. It's always scary to make a big change, right? It, it just is, especially when you've got a good paycheck coming in every week. So uh, that's going to be a reality of what you're looking at, no matter what. But it's going to be a lot easier if you can shorten the jump. And to do that, you've got to have some momentum and you've got to be very confident in the skill set that you have going on. Okay. All right. I think there were one or two up here in the beginning. Oh, okay. So I got all of those. Let me get back to the bottom. And well, yeah, we're going to have to, just enough time for questions. But I do, I would encourage you folks, um, especially if you've got things that you, you know, are struggling with and that intimidate you and frustrate you, um, take a look at the list. It's, it's on, you know, my Facebook profiles in the Facebook group. You're going to see you, you are not alone at all. Okay. Um, from Joe in Michigan here, uh, my biggest goal is to look back at old photos that I didn't like and see why I didn't like them and learn from them to make better shots. And Joe, honestly, that's something that everybody needs to do and everybody should be doing on a shoot by shoot basis, right? So in part, it's about changing your workflow, your current workflow, which I would encourage all of you to do. So, and some of you may have heard me talk about this before, but just to expand on it a little bit. Photographers, we all have a, a, honestly, it's a lazy habit. I was gonna say a bad habit, but it's a lazy habit. We do a shoot, we call through our images. Now we can even have software help us call. I'm gonna be talking about some really cool calling software in a few weeks, but you know, we, we call through the images, we find the two or three that we really like, we do whatever processing or retouching that we're gonna do, and we post them online or we send them to the client, and it's like, yay, we're happy, they're happy. And then, you know, some of you, um, you know, delete, um, a lot of your raw files, like the ones that you didn't cull down to, some of you keep everything, it doesn't matter, but you basically filed away and you forget about it. It's like, mission accomplished, here's my three great pictures, cool. And yet there's all these other pictures that you didn't like. Those are the pictures that can actually teach you things. And it's a real simple process. It's a matter of setting aside a little bit of time, going through those images, and asking yourself a very simple question. Why? Why didn't I pick this image? What could I do to make this image better? How do I need to do that? You notice the who, what, when, where, why happened in there again, right? So uh, it's simply a matter of investing the time. And, and here's why it works. It works because you're the one that took the pictures in the first place. You had the experience. So Joe, it's not bad to do what you're gonna do. The challenge is if there's images that you took six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, you may not remember all the details about how you set your lighting, why you made the choices, et cetera. So can you still learn from those images, Joe? Yes, you can. But if you're doing that exercise 48 hours after you did a shoot, you're still gonna remember all the details. You're gonna remember where you put your lights, why you put your lights, how you put your lights. You're gonna remember, oh yeah, I'm in that model, just being a pain in the ass, just talking my ear off the whole time and I was trying to think and you're gonna remember all of that and then you can learn from it, right? So all of you should be doing that. And by the way, gang, that I, I, I always use the people examples. That applies for landscape photographers. It applies for astrophotographers. It applies for commercial advertising photographers, food photographers, I don't care what you're shooting. Taking the time to go through your bad shots. The bad shots will teach you so much more than the good shots. But just like practice, just like anything else, it requires a little bit of effort, right? That's the key. So question here from Brian. When starting out, do you need a client's permission or have them sign something to use photo them for marketing or show other potential clients? So Brian, to, let's take that from the, from the end. To show another potential client, if you are showing that picture um, via like a print, like you're walking into a client's office and saying, you know, here, if you are um, showing a picture um, via email to say, yes, look, here's a portrait that I did and I can do that again, you do not need the client's permission. Now, I would still encourage you be a decent human being. Let's say the client that we're talking about, it's a photograph of a woman who um, is doing a boudoir session with you and the images are rather risque, right? Even though you legally do not need permission to show someone else the pictures directly, especially if you're doing it for the purpose of getting more work, you should get it, right? 
Now, as far as using the pictures for marketing and advertising, if we're talking about the idea of you posting them on social media or you using the images uh, on maybe a brochure that you're going to make or something like that, um, should you have their permission? Yes. Do you have to by law? Kind of. <laughs> now, I say this every time questions like this come up. Please, folks, do not take your legal advice from some guy on YouTube. Please, right? But the reality of it is, is that this is the super short answer, Brian, is, is yes, you do. You need their permission, right? Uh, but in today's world, look, we know full well, stuff gets posted on social media all the time. In fact, people post their own stuff on social media. So it, it's kind of this very loosey-goosey thing. Just the, the simple solution is this. Just get in the habit. If you are photographing people, if you are going to be doing client work with people, just get in the habit. Every shoot you do, have your subject sign a model and release. Uh, what I would encourage you to do is download an app like, um, uh, I use an app called Easy Release. There's another one somebody told me about recently. Do I still have it here? Yeah, it's called Model Releaser. I haven't had a chance to deal with it yet, but it's supposedly it's very similar to Easy Release. What I love about both of those apps is you can load your own release into it. So, cause I have some releases that I've modified, you know, for, for my use. Um, what's also great about those apps is, you know, basically when you had the person sign with it, they sign it right in your phone. You take a picture of them and it basically creates an embedded PDF with their signature, all the text of the release, their photo, the dates, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you can have it automatically save like right to Dropbox or right to iCloud. If you're an Apple user, that kind of thing. Uh, just makes it super, super simple. I haven't used a paper release probably five or six years now. Um, maybe maybe a little bit more than that, actually. Um, everything's digital. It's all stored in the cloud, multiple backups. So, you know, I'm good to go, right? Um, and what I wound up doing with my old paper releases, I had an intern scan all of them. I still, I still have to keep them, right? Because the scan of the paper releases, but but at least so that I have the information and have it accessible and it's all in one easy to find place. I have every modeling release that I've ever done in the cloud. But of course, prior to, it's like 2014, 2015, I think, all my releases are paper and I have them stored on site, um, the actual paper release. So yeah, it's just, it's a, a good idea. Um, it's a good idea to get in that habit, right? So, um, scrolling on up here. So, oh, uh, Mike had told me before, you're planning on doing portraits and headshots and actors and potentially pet photography. Okay, cool. That's a, that's a neat range of stuff, Mike. So again, you know, practice, practice, right? That's the key. Um, let's see, scrolling on up here. Uh, and where I know I saw another one here. There we go. Uh, uh, Roberto talking about Peter Lick. Yes, he's an Aussie. He's from down under. He, uh, he travels the world. You think he uses, he uses medium format and super white cameras, uh, for some shots, Robert, uh, not for everything. So, um, Peter Lick uses multiple formats in multiple places in multiple ways. There, there is, uh, you know, people, mostly photographers, <laughs> photographers like to be like, Oh, he does a lot of Photoshop. Yeah, he does a lot of Photoshop and, and it's amazing Photoshop, right? But the fact of the matter is he's an artist. He uses the format that fits uh, where he's shooting, uh, the location that he's working on, all that kind of stuff. And he does, you know, just brilliant work with the stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I would encourage anybody, if you, if you want to get a kick in the butt about what you can't do and what you need to work towards, go Google Peter Look, Lick and look at his images. If you get to go to Vegas... Uh, he has galleries all over Vegas. I actually saw two of his galleries while I was out there this time. Um, and um, anytime I walk past the Peter Lick Gallery in Vegas, I go in and I look around. Uh, even though I'm familiar with his work, I know his work. You can't help but just be in awe of those images. I mean, some of which are like eight feet wide, right? They're they're just huge and and they're amazing. So Darren, thank you so much for the super chat. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let's see here. Scroll on down. Um, I think, I think I'm kind of caught up here. Um, so I can hit, uh, uh, 
video for two. Uh, okay, so here's actually a, a question from Narban. What color should you paint the walls of your video or portrait studio? I would think black to give total control of light. Um, there's a couple ways that you can approach that in Narban. So traditionally, I have kept my studios painted white with some of the walls gray. The current studio that I have in the basement is all white. So it's white walls, white ceiling. And in part because it's a relatively small space, so I actually decided to build it in a way, and I use it in a way where I actually use the walls and the ceiling as modifiers, as reflectors, okay? And if I don't want them to be a part of the shot, I can either flag them with, you know, like a V-flat, or uh, I use the inverse square law by placing my key lights closer to my subject, right? Um, black will work the way that you suggested, meaning if you paint the, wor the, the walls black, you know, you're not getting light reflecting back, you have a lot more control, etc. Understand though that black can make the room feel really small. It can make the room feel kind of dingy. Um, I would suggest if you're photographing portraits or if you're working with models, black is potentially going to create uh, an uncomfortable environment to work in, right? Um, and so I am not a fan of that for those scenarios. Um, I work in a relatively small space. If you've seen the video here on YouTube, uh, my shooting space, the actual shooting space in my studio, I have a makeup room and some storage rooms and a changing room, but the shooting space is 13 feet wide by 27 feet long, and the ceiling is only just over seven and a half feet. So it's a relatively small space. I'm able to work fine with, um, with white walls. It's not a problem. I am in the midst of unloading a lot of unnecessary gear that I've collected over the years. And when I say unnecessary, it just means my shooting styles have changed, my habits have changed, it's time for a purge. As soon as I complete that, which I'm hoping to do by the end of spring, I intend to um, do a, a slight remodel of my studio, meaning um, I've got walls that I want to patch. I've got nicks and scrapes in the walls. I want to change the way that I hang some stuff on the walls. And when I do that, two of the walls are going to be painted gray this time around. Um, just because it will kind of be a shortcut, um, for me. So, um, that's, that's mainly why. Okay. So, uh, Alvin, what type of gray paint? Uh, just uh, middle tones and matte. It's not a specialized photography paint. Um, my favorite Savage Universal gray background color is called Thunder Gray. So if you want to work with that, that color, just download their color chart, right? And go to the paint store. And actually, you can put your, their color chart on your phone. Put it in a PDF on your phone. Go to the paint store and they can scan that color at the paint store and blend the paint to that color. Just make sure you're using matte paint, flat matte paint. Um, you don't want any kind of gloss or semi-gloss to it. Um, nothing like that at all. So, okay. Um, I saw one up here. Oh, wait, from Paul. There's there's another one too that I need to make sure that I get to. Let me just cue that up here so I don't miss it. Um, Richard, I saw your non-photo question. I will get to it. Just bear with me, okay? Uh, please don't post it though. I'll explain why, okay? Uh, Paul. I took on your black and white challenge from, whoops, it went away and I wasn't done reading. Let's come back. Uh, I took on your black and white challenge from last week, a white whale shot I've been trying to do. Worked out well following your suggestion. I've changed uh, the way I shoot now following your advice. Awesome. Glad to hear it, Paul. Um, yeah, I mean, believe me, the, the whole idea of setting your uh, in-camera profile to black and white if you want a black and white image, it is a game changer because it, ma it just makes you see things differently. It will change the way you set your exposure for shots. Um, lots of stuff. So totally, um, totally, it was a game changer for me. And I, I definitely, I always try to share that it's totally worth doing. So um, Richard, you asked a question, uh, non-photo question. Our fellow photographer, Irene Rudnick is Ukrainian, which I'm very aware of um, and has a video requesting uh, help for Ukraine. Would you mind if I posted the link in the video here on the channel? Uh, Richard, I'm going to ask you not to do that. And I'll explain why. Real simple. Number one, um, I am very aware of what's going on in Ukraine. I very much stand in support of the Ukrainian people. I have made donations through, um, you know, channels that are being recommended by our government. 
Um, I have not seen Irene's video. I don't doubt that she's made one. And I obviously, I, I cannot, I cannot even imagine um, having family, having relatives, having friends in the Ukraine. I can't imagine what these people are going through. Um, but we're going to stick with photography here. Um, I have worked very, very hard over the years. I avoid, I avoid world issues. I avoid politics. Um, so for any of you that are here, uh, if you know Irene, and if you want to support through the channels that she is asking you to support with, type her name into the box at the top. As soon as we're done, go to her channel and by all means do that. Um, but you know, uh, my prayers, my wishes are with the Ukrainian people. I think that what's happening to them is absolutely horrible. There's no way to justify it. And for me, I, I'm a news junkie. I watch a lot of the news. And obviously right now it's pretty much 24 seven Ukraine, the images, the videos, the stories that we're hearing. I find it unimaginable that in today's world, this is happening in our world. So uh, so thank you for asking, Richard. But folks, yes, if you if you want to support through, you know, uh, the channels that Irene has recommended, by all means, please visit her channel. Irene is absolutely awesome. Uh, I can only imagine, you know, what she's experiencing and how she's feeling about all this. And again, my thoughts and prayers are with the Ukrainian people. But on my channel, we're going to stick to the photography. OK. Um, all right. I saw a couple more coming real quick. We're going to um, let's see here. Uh, Aussie to you. I didn't forget your metaverse thing. Metaverse opportunities for photographers. So uh, the only reason I was I was honestly Aussie to you, hoping I wouldn't have to answer this tonight. I know I'm going to have to deal with it eventually, but um, I don't think there's a lot. Now, so that's the short answer. Before somebody decides to, you know, label me a baby boomer or just call me an old fart, Let's be really clear. I'll go toe to toe with anybody on knowledge of technology and where it's going. For those of you who've been following me since the beginning, go back and watch some of the early live streams I did. Go back and watch some of the early talks I gave and things that I was predicting five, six, seven years ago. They're here now, today. We're using them. I am all about future technologies, right? All about it. Um, I think that the metaverse, there will be people and photographers who will make some money on it. I think that there will be people and photographers that will make a crap ton of money on it. Is it the future? No. And here's why I say that. It's not because I'm old. It's not because I like things better the way they were. I think it's really, really cool technology. But the fact of the matter is that innately, people are social beings who thrive on and desire contact. Now, there's a lot of uh, social psychology looking at younger generations and what's happening in the world and talking about the idea that, you know, younger generations really struggle with um, interacting. And, and part of that is because they spend so much time hands down, but there is still that need. The, the metaverse is not going to replace reality, just like NFTs. NFTs are a freaking joke. Uh, look, Gary V. If you don't know who he is, you can go check him out. But Gary Vee is like the world's business proponent. I know Lindsay Adler is all in, in the NFTs. Look, these are people I respect. I think Gary Vee is freaking awesome. Lindsay Adler, obviously, I love her. I love her work. NFTs are problematic. For me, I'm not going to spend my money on something that anybody else can do something with that they feel like. If it's mine, it's freaking mine. Hands off. Go away, right? <laughs> Done. So... <laughs> And, and, and ultimately, I guarantee you that's how it's going to play out. If people are going to invest big money in things, they're going to want, they're going to want real ownership, not virtual ownership, right? I mean, think about it. If somebody said to you, hey, for $10, I'll sell you 5% of the Mona Lisa, who's going to make that investment? Nobody's going to make that investment. Come on, right? It's, it's not going to happen. So... Yeah. Do, do I think it's a future? No, it's no different than Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, all that. And I know I'm going to piss somebody off here, but you know, I've been saying it for ages. The whole problem with all the cryptocurrency and the Bitcoin stuff is it's basically going around the government. And what happened today already? President of the United States has just started a commission or whatever to look into what kind of government regulation do we need to have? Because the fact of the matter is 
Countries can't survive if you bypass their economy. The world will freaking collapse. So this whole cryptocurrency, plus it's freaking computers. It's computers. Everything's virtual. Everybody has access to all the information. It's already been hacked. People have already lost billions because they tossed away a stupid wallet. No, it is not the future. Is it going to evolve? Will it be here for a long time? Will it in some way be a currency that gets used? Of course it will. But no. Um, you know, I think the opportunity for the metaverse at this point, uh, for me, it's what I normally do with new technologies like this. I keep an eye on it. I learn as much as I can about it. Uh, at a minimum, at a minimum, I make sure that I have a solid, basic understanding. That's what I would say that I have of NFTs. I'm not an NFT expert by any means, but I have a solid, basic understanding of NFTs, how the process works, what's involved. And I'm very confident in the knowledge that I have. Um, but I do not see it being the big opportunity. But that doesn't mean that there won't be some people that make a boatload of money because they'll get in first, they'll do something kind of interesting. And while it's, um, you know, kind of uh, cool and everybody's talking about it, they will make a, a, a boatload of money. But, um, you know, it's it's not... Robert, this isn't a rant, man. It's a... My gosh, Robert, here we go. Um, this is hardly a rant. This is just, you know, the, the way that I see what's going to happen. Um, I'm not an expert when it comes to that. Uh, so it's literally just based on my age and how long I've been here, what I think it's going to be. I, I don't think the metaverse... Um, you know, Caitlin, not to disagree with you, I don't think the metaverse is a fad. Uh, I do think it's here to stay. I do think NFTs are here to stay. I think cryptocurrency is here to stay, but they're not going to be kind of the, the big overall boom that so many people are excited about. Uh, because all three of those things, metaverse, NFTs, cryptocurrency, uh, as it stands today, there are major, major problems with them if you imagine them into the future and if you imagine more and more people getting involved and if you imagine them cutting out traditional parts of our economy and the way we do business and all that, um, there are big issues that have to be solved and have to work out. And in order to work those things out, it's actually going to kind of water down what these things are now and it's going to bring them more mainstream. So yeah, when we get to that point, I, I think that there, you know, there may be a little bit more value. Um, I think there's a great argument that says, um, you know, you might go shopping, like shopping Amazon, right on the metaverse, because the idea would be like, look, you could look at all this stuff virtually and you could see the stuff, you know, in 3d and all that kind of stuff. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I think if you kind of dream with all of it, there's a lot of cool possibilities, but I just don't imagine. And you know what? I, I Again, I could be totally wrong, but I don't imagine the idea that, you know, people are going to want to pay money to have a picture to hang on their wall in the metaverse. A picture that anybody else could just go click, copy and stick it on their wall. And then somebody sticks it on their wall and then their wall and then, and then everybody's got the same picture. But But you happen to be the person that owns it. <laughs> okay, that's great. So I spent all that money so that everybody else could have it. See what I'm saying? So, I, you know, I, I get it. it. There's an investment element to it. I, I just don't see it happening. And part of the reason is um, we have a long, there, there's a reason why, you know, our economy is based on, is based on gold, right? Uh, actual tangible gold. Gold has been at the core of so many world economies for throughout history it's tangible so the problem with all this stuff is none of it's tangible and and that's where the problem comes in it, it's how how much can we really build on something that's completely virtual time will tell so anyway gang uh, enough of me predicting the future because i'm certainly probably not the the one to do it but uh, listen for those of you that participated tonight with things that you want to get done this year and even for those of you that didn't, I know you have things that you want to get done, right? And even for Robert Varner, I know you have things you want to improve on. Otherwise, dude, seriously, sell the camera and, and stop telling me your opinion on everything because that's not why we're here. Just saying, man. Okay? I appreciate you coming out, but come on. 
listen, and you might actually learn something. And if you don't feel you have anything to learn, then why are you here other than to annoy me? Right? So go check out the stuff that's on Facebook, on my profile, in the talk chat group. Number one, you're not alone with the things that you're struggling with and the things you want to accomplish. Number two, it's good to have goals. It's really good to have goals. But now you got to put in the work and you know the drill. What does that mean? That means go pick up that camera and shoot something because your best shot, it's your next shot, gang. Adios. Have a great week. Hope to see you at the Vigil Storytelling Conference on Friday. If you're there, make sure you say hi. Take care.